Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the first distinguished lecture of the um, uh, academic year. Uh, my name is Mehmet Tosun. Uh, I'm a professor of economics and the director of the Osman Center for Entrepreneurship and the International Programs <clears throat> in the College of Business. Um, uh, so uh, this uh, lecture series is organized by the Osman Center and the MB Global, our uh, new lab initiative. Uh, it is our pleasure to host virtually uh, Professor John Liss from the University of Chicago today. Um, Professor Liss' lecture is titled Voltage Effect uh, in Behavioral Economics. So I'm going to invite uh, Professor Mark Pingel, uh, who will introduce the speaker formally. And, and Professor Pingel is uh, a professor uh, in, in our university. He's a professor of economics, uh, and he also specializes in behavioral economics, uh, among many other things that he, he is doing. Um, so, uh, Professor Pingel will moderate the Q&A at the end uh, as well, and I'd like to just uh, uh, note that uh, we're going to have about 15 minutes at the end for the questions, and uh, please write your questions in the Q&A tool at the bottom uh, of your screen, and uh, you don't have to wait until the end. You can, you know, start writing your questions, um, uh, you know, during the lecture. So, uh, with that, uh, Professor List, uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and I hope we will have you in person at some point uh, in the near future. And uh, Mark, uh, you have the Zoom. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce John List to you. John's at the University of Chicago. He there is the Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Service Professor of Economics. He's known for his work in field experiments, though he is amazingly productive, in my view, branching out into a number of areas. He's applied that especially to try to understand how markets work, but he's delved into many aspects of behavioral economics. In behavioral economics, what we do and what John's been especially effective at doing is taking the standard notion that I would say incentives matter is the, the standard model of economics, but a variety of things matter in behavioral economics and especially field research allows uh, economists like John to get at this and help us understand all this more. Because he's done such a good job, he's actually interacted, been on the Council of Economic Advisors. I know he's collaborated with many companies that you've heard of, Lyft, Uber, United Airlines, uh, many others are listed in your program. He is very productive in, in terms of writing journal articles, over 200 of those. He's published books. He'll focus on one today. I would encourage you to get on Amazon and look at the others. He's won a number of awards, the Kenneth Galbraith Award 2010, the Arrow Prize for Senior Economists in 2008. Um, 2012, the, how do you say that, John, Euro Johansson? Uh, yeah, it's Ro Johansson, that's right. Ro, okay. <laughs> And I'll just, well, he's editor of Journal of Political Economy, which is one of the top five journals that economists always would like to publish in. Uh, and I'll just say, I mentioned to John while we were preparing for this, that if he doesn't win the Nobel Prize, there's something wrong with those Nobel print people in the near future. So I guess you have to be living and you're young. So if you don't win it, uh, there's something wrong. But keep up the good work. We're looking forward to what you have to say. So please go ahead, John. Uh, Mark, that's so, so very kind of you. Um, feelings are mutual, of course. Mark's been a, a friend for a long time, and um, it, it's great to be, quote, back in, in Reno. I, I visited Reno a long time ago, um, and it's a special place, and it's, it's just a wonderful uh, group of people there. So it, it, I'm really proud to have a chance to tell you about my book today. Okay, so I'm going to go into shared screen mode, and you're going to have to help me and make sure, are we, Mark, are we good there? Can we see my, my screen okay? I can see it, yes. Okay, excellent, excellent. So everyone, I'm, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes or so. And what I want to talk about is something that you probably never thought about, and that's the voltage effect in behavioral economics. Now, the, the general question around the voltage effect, and I'll define what the voltage effect is in a few moments, 
is essentially why do so many programs or ideas fail to deliver what they promise when we scale them? And that's something that in my own work, I, I call the science of using science. And when I think about my own research, I started off in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, doing field experiments. And essentially, as Mark said, I use the world as my lab. And I essentially try to test for intervention effects, try to explore mediators and mechanisms and moderators to learn about the world and to test economic theory. Today, I'm going to talk about what you might say is the back nine of my career if you're a golfer. And this is after you find some great intervention works, what is the science of actually scaling that science? Okay, so I'm going to begin with something fun, which I do in a lot of cases. And I want to run an experiment today. And the experiment will be related, you'll see, to the theory that I present a little bit later. But what I want you to think about is a simple job that I want you to do. So your chore is to guess an integer, one to 100 inclusive, that is two thirds of this group's average guess. Okay? Now, the winner of this competition will, of course, receive a prize. I want to make sure that you're well incentivized. As an experimental economist, that's, that's what I like to do. So you can say, well, what's the prize? The prize is a signed copy of my book when it comes out. OK, so the winner, you can tell me to put on any inscription you want. And the first week in February, I will send you a signed copy of The Voltage Effect. Now, as a bonus book opportunity, I want you also, I'm going to give you a form in a minute. I want you also to include a second number that you believe is the equilibrium to this game. So, so gang, what I want you to do is use this QR code. You'll be taken to a survey. So this is an official experiment. And in that survey, you're going to be asked to, first of all, guess what you think is 2 thirds of this group's average. And then you will be asked about um, equilibrium to this game. And at the end of today's lecture, I will be announcing the two winners. So if there are multiple winners, I'll randomly choose one to, um, to win the book in each case. OK? So I'll give you a few moments to think about what you want to put down. And if you want, I can go back again to the instruction screen if everybody has a QR code now. I can certainly go back to the instruction screen for you. Mark, did you get the equilibrium? Say that again, did I get the equilibrium? Yeah, do you think you got the equilibrium? Well, I know the formal equilibrium. I don't know what your- No, no that's all I want. Look, I want the theoretical equilibrium. Okay, yeah. yeah, I think I know it, but- Okay, so again, let me remind you, you will choose a number one to 100 inclusive. This is a hard part, right? Is you, you're trying to guess what other people are going to guess. So you have to use it, use your game theory and put yourself in the shoes of someone else. In fact, the, uh, the rest of the group. And then secondly, I want you to write down what is the theoretical equilibrium to this game. And Mark probably teaches this in his class, uh, the famous game. OK. So at the end of today's lecture, we, we will go over the, the two winners of that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that, how that matches what I'm trying to do here today. OK. And again, that's the QR code if you need it. So, so this will get you to the survey. OK, very good. So let's get started. So let me start with 
what I want you to take away from today's lecture. I, I want you to, first of all, learn about this stylized fact that, you know, in economics, we don't really have quantitative laws like physics and the hard sciences have, but we have laws of demand and supply and law of comparative advantage. And with people, they, they basically come as close to a law as you can. I'm gonna talk about something that I think is also nearly a law, and that's gonna be the voltage effect. Secondly, I want you to think about scaling as being like we think about DNA. And in that way, do the policies or ideas that we think about scaling have the necessary vitality and in that way, I'm gonna define five vitals that every scalable idea will have. Now, when doing this, what jumps out is we always banter about evidence-based policy. I'm gonna to argue today that I wanna make that extinct. And I want us to think about the policy problem is one that demands policy-based evidence. And then finally, in that new world, in the past, we thought about, does this intervention work? And we thought about why. That's the mechanisms behind why an intervention might work. We need to do that today, but we also need to think about for whom, where, under what terms, and at what cost. That's what the new world of decision-making demands. Okay, so those are the four things that when you walk out of here, I want you to, to take away. So let's talk a little bit about my scaling road. So about 12 years ago, 12 to 15 years ago, there's a community in Chicago called Chicago Heights that is a very poor community. And they're really a community that the modern economy has left behind. They're a community whereby 90 to 95% of households are on food stamps. Uh, there are many broken families, many broken dreams. You have at our two high schools in Chicago Heights, you have say a thousand kids entering high school every year and only 460 of those will end up getting a high school diploma. So you have really a broken public education school system that's very similar to the public education, let's say schooling districts that we have in urban settings in America. So they asked me if I could come in and help them. And for their part, they said, we will open up and allow our school district to be your lab. Now, that's great. When you do that to a person who's interested in field experiments and economics, that, that's a great offer. So I raised some money and I started to do experiments amongst 15 and 16 year olds. I was doing a bunch of adolescent experiments, more or less along the lines of trying to keep them interested in school and trying to keep them from dropping out because many people drop out right at their 16th birthdays. So, so that worked a little bit, but what we met was this problem that when you start to help a 15 and 16 year old, in many cases, it's a little too late because a 15 year old who's reading at a first grade level or a 16 year old who's doing math at a second grade level, that's very difficult to get all of those past years back and have them become engineers or really develop into what they should have developed into had society not let them down. So what we did essentially then was to turn back the clock. And I said, well, the only way after this problem is to go after the zero to five age group and get these kids and their families on the right path from the very beginning. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a preschool that I started for three, four and five year olds. And this was a preschool literally 
that I started from the ground up. I didn't build this building. This building was was given to me uh, to run our programs in. But literally everything else was from scratch. Developing curricula, hiring teachers, meeting the state laws and ordinances. And essentially it took a very long time to create what is now called the Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center. So we've been doing this now for about 12 years and the target population for check is three, four and five year olds. We have other research where we start in the delivery room. Today, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about check, the three, four and five year olds. Our, our first cohort are now sophomores and juniors and we've been tracking them since we first entered their lives as three, four and five year olds. Thousands and thousands of kids have gone through our program now. And we work very hard to, to develop a very scientifically based, robust and rigorous program that really, really helped the kids. Okay? And I'm not going to go through those formal results. If you want a set of papers, I, I'll be glad to send those along. But in the end of the day, what you find is we have a really great program. So now, of course, this is my past self, is I say, this is around 2013 or 2014, I say, I've developed this great intervention in Chicago Heights. I want every kid in the world to have this program. And the way I set it up was it wasn't, the curriculum wasn't for sale. We were going to give it away for free. And we still are giving it away for free. The idea is to try to lessen the opportunity gap by giving everyone in the world a great pre-K curriculum that includes a parent academy alongside a school where the kids come every day for, for 10 months. So I went to policymakers and I went to experts. And here was my slap in the face. Here's what I got. Professor List, your program had an impressive benefit profile, but don't expect it to happen at scale. I said, well, why is that the case? They said, typically, it doesn't have the silver bullet. And I said, well, well, what is the silver bullet that we should be searching for? And then they go on to say, all of the experts tell us their intervention will work. But when we actually scale it, what they promise is never close to what happens in reality. And then they go on to say, you know, there's this new area called implementation science. It tends to be a group of psychologists. They tell us that it's because of fidelity, but we just don't know. So now you get, the, you get this great program in place. You want to help the world. And now you're slapped in the face with this new problem. This is what I call the voltage effect in the book. It's essentially making a mountain into a molehill. You have this great result in the Petri dish, you scale it up and it's just a fraction of the success that you thought it was going to be, okay? So now you can say, well, well where did you start then? Where we started is we wanted to learn about the science of using science or what's the science of this scaling phenomenon that I'm calling the voltage effect. So as any good economist will do, you start by creating models and writing down economic theory. Now within those models, you have to recognize who are the important actors who are part of scaling a program. So what we have in our models, we have the researcher, the researcher has an objective function, we have policymaker, practitioner, funder, participants. They then engage in a game theoretic model. And what does that mean? It means thinking like you just did in the experiment. You have to put yourself in the shoes of other people figure out what you want, what are your incentives, and then figure out what other people want within this knowledge creation system. And then you act accordingly and they act accordingly. 
exactly as you just did in the beauty contest game that we did at the beginning. Okay. So we solve all of that out. We end up putting all of those equations and, and those are in academic papers now buried in academic journals. And we then combine that theory with what I would call DNA evidence. We're looking at the DNA from thousands of studies to figure out where is our theory right? Where is it wrong? And what can we in general take from both the theory and the empirical work, the DNA evidence that we can call and learn about the science of scaling? Okay, so my thesis today is unlike and very different from what the policymakers and the experts told us at the very beginning. This is not a silver bullet problem. This is more like a weakest link problem. And I'll come back to that in a bit. The idea must possess the five vital signs before we can be sure that when we scale it, it will scale effectively. Now in that way, what these five vital signs allow us to do is they're really hiding in plain sight as you'll see, but they give us really insights about the breadth and depth of your idea. How broadly can it apply? How deep can the impact be? And I argue that's important to know before we roll it out or before we spend a bunch of money trying to make it really, really big when by its DNA, it has no chance of being big. Okay, so that's the idea now of the science of using science. Okay, so let's talk now about the five vital signs. The first vital sign is what I'm gonna call the inference problem. And this is basically determining, did the initial data lie? Were they a false positive? And in most of our parlance, this is called a statistical error. The sample diverts from the population. Now, what becomes clear when you look into this vital sign is the import of replication. Let's go back to check. What I have in the, in the dark box here is, I'm, I'm thinking like a Bayesian now, and I'm using this post-study probability equation. This equation comes from a paper that I published back in 2014 in the AER on how to make use of new evidence, but it's basically the simple Bayesian uh, updating rule. So here's what the box tells us. If somebody looked at my study and they said, wow, John's doing this work in Chicago Heights. I, I don't think it's gonna work. In fact, I'm very skeptical. So my prior on this working, my probability that I'm attaching to John's study working is 1%. My study is well-powered. This is what this means, it's well-powered. So after I publish my study, this is where policymakers most of the time get it wrong, is they think if the paper is published in a peer reviewed journal, it must be the truth. What this equation tells you is that now if you were deeply skeptical, if you thought before it was only a 1% chance, now it's a 2% chance. That's what this tells you, post study probability of 2%. Okay, let's say you replicate that once. After the first replication, now it goes to 10%. After the second replication, it goes to 47%. After the third, it goes to 91%. So after two or three replications here, we get to be more and more sure that the data are not lying, okay? Now you can say, well, what's an example of this? An example of this is when I was in high school and in the 80s, a lot of you are too young for this, I suspect, but there was a real drug epidemic amongst youth in the United States. And Nancy Reagan decided to take it upon herself to go out and attack that drug problem using a just say no campaign. I can remember when they came to my high school and the, the people who were it implementing this, the administrators gave us the educational program called DARE. And I looked at my teacher and I said, look, I don't use drugs, but I have some friends who do. And there's no way that this campaign will work. 
it's a little bit like you think about the opioid epidemic now and, and having education solve that. It's like, there's no way. My high school teacher said something along the lines of, yeah, John, you might be right, but they say that there's a lot of data behind it. So I've looked. There was a pretty good study behind it. It was a study done in Honolulu with about 1,700 kids, and it did work there, but it turned out that that was a false positive. It turned out that when you go back and do it again and again, it doesn't work the second and third time, nor does it work in LA or New York or Chicago. So it turned out we wasted a lot of money and a lot of, Nancy Reagan's a great person. It, Mark mentioned when I worked in the White House, Nancy Reagan would come around a lot. And she meant well by this, but she was selling a false positive. We wasted a lot of resources, time and money. Okay. So John, that's, can I ask, can I ask go ahead, Mark, go ahead. This that I don't know if others have this question, but from your Bayesian example, I guess what I'm taking is it's not so much a false positive, but it takes a number of interactions before you believe it and you might give up before you try it long enough. Am I missing something there or it really was a well, false well, positive? Well, okay, so let's be clear. Um, it was a false positive because the truth was that you landed somewhere in alpha of 0.05 bill and, and the true program null was a zero program effect. Okay. But you just had an alpha of 0.05. So 5% of the time, you will have a false positive. Um, that's what I'm saying happens here. Okay. So to know whether it's a false positive, I'm not saying do check four times over again, because then by the time we have the truth, um, it's done. Maybe the world's changed too much. I'm saying take the fundamental features of check and make sure they work in several smaller scale multi-site trials. No, and then no, put that all together, and then we can scale it within a year or two. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So in an ocular sense, here's the way I want you to think about the inference problem. It can be simply the data line, a way to solve that. Multi-site trials quickly replicate, and we can see if we have the truth or not. Okay. Vital sign number two. In economies, I would call this a representativeness of the population. So I want you to think about this as, does that result horizontally scale or does it spread? Do the results apply to others? Here, going back to check, you can say, look, that worked for check kids and their parents. But what about others who might be different socioeconomic status or different race, different backgrounds, et cetera? Maybe that matters. OK. So what I'm arguing here is you find it in Illinois, in Chicago Heights. You show it's not a false positive. You then do it in California. You do it in Denver. You do it in Atlanta. You do it in Vegas, wherever. And after you spread that across cities, you can be confident that your program can horizontally scale. And what I'm talking about here is horizontally scale across markets. Same program, just different populations. Now you can say, well, how often does this happen? Let's talk about an example from India. This is a famous example about anemia. Look, anemia is a big problem. It affects, some experts say, 1.6 billion people worldwide. Iron deficiency is the leading cause of anemia. So what's really interesting, about 15 years ago, some small scale studies showed that double fortified salt could really help for young females, okay? Surprisingly, in 2012, they did a nationwide scale up of those studies that were based on young females and found it was a big zero effect. The reason why is because DFS is found to only work for young females. And when you scale it up, it ends up being the wrong population. If we would have known that right away, for whom does our intervention or product work, we can then scale to them. And then we have to find something different to scale to everyone else. There's a representativeness of the population problem. And again, in our ocular scheme, you can see that when you scale something and don't understand who it works for, 
this can kind of happen if the researcher is nefarious. A lot of times what you have is scientists giving their ideas their best shot. And then they publish the paper and forget to let everyone know that it was an efficacy test. As in medicine, they say it needs to be efficacy then phase one, two, and three. They make sure to do that in medicine, but we tend not to do that in the social sciences. And if you simply say, look, the researcher isn't nefarious, that you can still get this result because you can think about who are the first people to stand in line for a new treatment or a new intervention. It's those people who are expected to benefit the most from it. So if the researcher is just saying, look, I have a fixed budget and I wanna get as many people as I can with my budget because I wanna maximize experimental power, guess what? With a lower subject fee, the people who are again standing in line are the ones who are most likely to benefit from the program. That's what we learn in economics. Okay, so the, the researcher does not even need to be nefarious for this to happen. Vital sign number three, we now move from the population to the situation. And here I want you to think about before we're doing horizontal scaling, now I want you to think about both horizontal and vertical scaling. So we want to spread to other situations and other settings our ideas. Now, when you vertically scale, you now might meet some constraints in terms of resources or infrastructure. There are a lot of papers where the Petri dish, they spend a lot of resources per person, and then they scale it up, and the resources per person are only like 10 or 20% of what they were in the Petri dish. And then there's no way that you're replicating the secret sauce that was in the Petri dish. So in the book, I talk about this is, is it the chef or is it the ingredients? Humans don't scale very well is the truth. But if you have a restaurant where you're scaling the ingredients, that can actually scale. So if you think about check, when I hired 30 teachers, that might not have been very hard to hire 30 high quality teachers from Chicago Heights. But if I wanna vertically scale in Chicago Heights, or around Chicago Heights, and I wanna hire 30,000 teachers, good luck. If teachers are the secret sauce, my program won't work when I try to vertically scale because there just aren't enough good inputs around to hire 30,000 really good teachers. Now, the situational bin is actually quite rich. So let me dig in a little bit more to this case about when you scale something, a lot of times you're relying on the administrators or facilitators to scale up with fidelity. What you find in the literature is if those administrators know the whys behind an intervention, for example, um, why does seaweed help with goiter? Or, or why does vitamin C uh, help with scurvy, et cetera? If they know the whys, behind the intervention, they're much more faithful to the program is what we find. Secondly, don't try to scale humans, try to scale technology as often as you can. Whenever you can turn humans or anything that is manipulable into something that is standardized, you need to do it. Third, as researchers, we need to give policymakers what are the non-negotiables and what are the negotiables that you need in place before you scale. I very rarely see this demanded from the scientists. I very rarely see all of us as scientists supplying this information. Something also that I don't see is the original scientists should be on the implementation team. Whether it's in a firm or whether it's in government, it's very important for fidelity purposes that the scientist is alongside the implementation team. Now, this was not my original slide, but this was, I saw this over in Europe. Um, this gives you an indication that scientists and policymakers think about problems very differently. And what goes through their minds when they're thinking about scaling or ideas is very different. And having both of these at the table, they can serve very important complements for one another.
okay? Now, what the proposal here then is, we oftentimes block on people to make sure we get a representative sample. What I'm proposing is you block on situational features, okay? And in that way, you're going from evidence-based policy to policy-based evidence because you're saying, what are the constraints and what are the realities at scale? Let's bring those back to the Petri dish and let's see if my program still works when those constraints are in place. Maybe I can't have the 30 best teachers in the world. I'm gonna have 30 really low quality teachers. Does check still work? Now, the proposal then to policymakers is when you actually scale up a program, please, please, please scale it in a way that gives all of us a chance to see if it did work. Most of the times you do it in ways where it's impossible to tell if it's working at scale. That, that's one big impediment about trying to put together a lot of information on what fails to scale and what works at scale is a lot of times when people roll something out at scale, we can't figure out if it worked or not. So in our schematic, what we have here is you have situational features that change. This is an important part of the voltage effect because you change the elements of the situation. There are some meta-analyses that suggest that 30% of the voltage effect is simply due to administrative fidelity. And that's why I went through ways to think about and tackle the fidelity issue. But now you can see, well, what do we need to stay faithful to? These are the non-negotiables. And then that's what leads to my, my takeaway message for you here is that we need to be thinking about this problem in a reverse way of what we usually think about it. Think about it as policy-based evidence. Bin number four, spillovers and general equilibrium effects. Okay, so here, here's an example of spillovers. In our check experiment, if you're a control kid, that means you get nothing formally from us in, the, in our experiment. If you're a control kid, but you live near other treatment kids, if you live near enough of them, it was actually like you were treated. And the spillovers worked through the kids and through the parents. Okay, so that's an incredible result that we need to understand. What are the spillovers that happen with our programs? It's possible that when you take account of these spillovers, and what I'm talking about is these results that the treatment crosses lines in in experimental parlance, it's called a SUTPA violation. But I'm saying that this is good for programs because you might actually get high voltage at scale, okay? If you have really good spillovers when you go up to scale. And there, what I'm referring to is think about Facebook. Facebook isn't the best example because people are very angry at Facebook right now, and rightfully so. But what happens with Facebook is, as more and more people use Facebook, that good or service actually gets more valuable because the, the network externalities become more and more important. So that's something that if we understand it, you wanna scale more and more of those ideas. Might not look good in the Petri dish, but because of spillovers, they look great at scale. Now, the other half of that is what economists call general equilibrium effects. Now, here, what we typically do is we go ahead and get a group of students, we put some of them in treatment, some in control, and then we say, here's the result, ceteris paribus. That's great for a test of theory, but it's actually really not what you want to learn when you scale something. What you really want to learn is what are the differences and outcomes when every child in society is treated versus when no one is treated. That's really what we wanna know when we scale something. Why? Because perturbing the whole system can be very different than what you observe when you do it on a small scale. In the book, I talk a lot about, in this, in this particular chapter, I talk a lot about Uber. So, so I used to be the chief economist at Uber. And working with Travis Kalanick, we did an experiment whereby we tried to raise the wages paid to drivers. So what we did is we raised their rate card. That's, that's their pay per minute and pay per mile. 
We did that for 5% of the drivers. And what happened was brilliant. They worked a little bit more, they were paid more, we effectively raised their wages and we got them to work a little bit more. But then we tried it again with 95% of the drivers in the market. Now guess what happened? It went to an entirely new equilibrium where they all worked more, but that served to depress everyone's wages because the drivers were sitting around empty more often and you're only paid on Uber is if you have somebody in your back seat. So they treated all of those drivers, we effectively undid the good stuff. And in the end, it turned out that we didn't change driver pay at all when, when we treated 95% of them. Okay, so that was a lesson that I draw out in the book that when gender equilibrium effects are important, the first trials might teach us very little about what happens at scale. We need to understand both spillovers and gender equilibrium effects. Now in our schematic, of course, those gender equilibrium effects can be positive or negative. In the Uber case, you can see it's a voltage drop because B gets a little bit smaller. Okay, so that's the fourth um, vital sign. And the fifth one, of course, is what we economists, uh, this is our bread and butter. And this is very, very rarely talked about in this literature. In fact, I've never seen it discussed. And that's, what does the supply side look like? And effectively, what I'm asking here is, are there economies or diseconomies of scale? Let's think about the check example. If I want to maintain really, really high quality for all 30,000 teachers that I hire, what am I going to need to do? I'm going to need to go up the supply curve, and I'm going to need to raise wages more and more to attract high quality teachers to teach in this particular program. That now is not a voltage drop on the benefit side, but it's potentially a huge voltage drop because of the supply side. It's a very different cost profile compared to when we only hired 30 teachers. In many cases, we forget about the supply side. Now in our schematic here, really what I'm talking about is, are there economies or diseconomies of scale? And I'm introducing the supply side to where Every good firm, when you think about it, Amazon, Tesla, Uber, Lyft, et cetera, they all have high voltage because of the supply side. Uh, when, when, I, when I wrote the book, I went through examples both in government and business, and nearly every time they're leveraging supply side voltage effects, which kind of which is kind of eye-opening eye to me. Now like I mentioned, I've, I've just never seen this in the literature, but I also don't see it in our academic papers. We should report both the benefit side and the cost side when we're talking about scaling our ideas. Okay, so there you have it. There you have it. That is a whirlwind tour of the five vital signs that any good idea has to have. I want you to think about this in an Anna Karenina sense. Like I mentioned earlier, think about this as a weakest link problem, not a silver bullet. Remember the first line in Anna Karenina. Happy families are all alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Except for the name and a few other changes, scaling is isomorphic. Scalable ideas are all alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way, comma, it will be a function of these five vital signs. One, two, three, four, or all five are violated each time we have a voltage drop. Okay. Now let's go back to the beauty contest game. And let me, before I start taking questions, I want to see if my, uh, my faithful assistant um, can help me. So, so gang, that was a game that was originally conceived by John Maynard Keynes. 
And he called it the beauty contest game. He literally ran a contest in a newspaper where he put up pictures of women and he asked readers to, to tell him who other readers will say is the most beautiful woman of the group. And he likened that to picking stocks in the stock market. He argued that picking stocks is not about what you think will do well, but it's about what other people think will do well. And that has become a very famous game in experimental economics. So the winner is Ty Jensen. So I am told that Ty Jensen won both. Um, so Ty, I will send you one signed copy. And then my faithful assistant said, second for the equilibrium answer is Trevor McElmore. The equilibrium to that game is one. Now, many of you guessed zero. Let me stop sharing here. Now, zero cannot be an equilibrium because remember, the, the game was choose a number inclusive between one and 100. So people can't choose zero to that game. It's not in the set that's feasible. What's in the set that's feasible, of course, is one. And that is the equilibrium to this game. I want you to think about equilibrium in that once people choose that number, no one has an incentive to change. Okay, so once everyone chooses one, no one has an incentive to move from one. Okay, so I want to congratulate uh, both Ty and Trevor. And he, I'm also told that Elliot Parker cheated by entering twice, and Kevin Gang was too clever by half and guessed two thirds. So that's uh, some notes to some of you. Um, but I'll now turn it over to, um, to Mark, and I'll take any questions you have for as long as you'd like to keep me. Just on that game, did you get the winning guess? What was the yeah, number? I'm, I, I'm trying to get, uh, I, I have the distribution, and it looks like the winning guess is around 20. Okay. But, but I, um, Ty, can you say in the chat what you guessed? I can show you the, the uh, it's not, uh, I was going to show you the distribution, but I have this nasty thing. Behind You'll have me. to put it in the, oh, he's here. He says, great. Thank you. 22. Okay. Yeah. Now, now Mark, as you know, I, I've, I've run this a lot and um, 22 is what I would call a smart groups answer. So I, I say anywhere between 15 and 23 or 24 they, they tend to be second or third order thinkers on average, and it tends to be, quote, a smart group. So congratulations, everyone. You're a smart group. Well, see, I mistakenly picked zero because I didn't see the one to 100, but I, I put 15 because I thought it would be a smarter group than it was. <laughs> but <laughs> but that's, no, that's, that's fun. Great. That's very fun. And I'll mention as we move to the... Uh, I can't remember, I guess Tyler must be an MBA student because that's where I do teach this. And, and he uh, said, I think Professor Pinkle taught me this in class. So maybe it's unfair that he won. But no, 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 anyway. <laughs> perfectly fine. Uh, yeah. what, you, what you both need to do is, is email. There should be an email in there and just tell me what you would like the inscription to be. So it has to be clean, So, but it like, Trevor, you're the greatest economist I've ever met. Signed, John List. That's fine, but but don't not nothing uh, political or or naughty. Yeah, that's neat. Thanks for that. Cool. So you're ready for some questions? Fire away. Sounds great. And and people are typing more in now, but I'll do a couple that came in earlier. As you were going through your school, a question popped in and asked: Did people self-select, or did you try to randomize the group? That you... oh, that, that's a great question. Yeah. So <clears throat> the way we did the program is we announced the program and we had people sign up and then we randomized over everyone who signed up. Now, 
that 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 gives you kind of two impressions. So I learn about the treatment effect of everyone who signs up, but I have to make a structural assumption if I want to learn about the people who did sign up. This is what I'm writing a textbook in experimental economics, and it's what I call the P equals zero and P equal one groups. The P equal one groups are those who sign up for an experiment and then get randomized. But, but let's be clear that with, with naturally occurring data, a lot of times you just have people select into taking schooling. That's not what's happening here. You're selecting into signing up for check, and then you get randomized into treatment cell, the typical way that we as experimentalists do it. But what I'm saying is you still have to make an assumption when you jump to the whole population, because there were some people who didn't sign up. What's interesting in our data is by the fourth year of our study, we got nearly 100% of people in Chicago Heights who were eligible signing up. Wow. In, uh, in the first year, it was roughly 85 to 90%. So what you do there is, is that's an interesting finding in and of itself. And then we can find out about the treatment effect didn't vary that much. So there wasn't a ton of sorting in, in our particular experiment. That's a great question. Yeah. Another question from one of our professors, Todd Sorensen, has to do with one of our faculty, Anna Sokolova, has published well with meta-analyses. Yeah. And his question basically is whether, because I guess in this meta-analysis, you can find publication bias yeah. that maybe has to do with some of the factors. And so might meta-analyses I, I guess when you do a meta-analysis, you're looking at replication almost anyway. I guess Todd's question is, could that handle some of the problems that you're mentioning? Yes. So I've, uh, I've actually um, done a few of these meta-analyses myself back in the day um, on cigarette consumption, on CBM, on alcohol taxes, et cetera. I, I do think there's an important role to be played um, using meta-analyses, absolutely. I think a lot of times, if you don't have enough overlap and support, it's sometimes difficult to find out some of the more disaggregated things that you would need when you pile um, study upon study. Now, my DNA analysis is, in many of the areas, a big analysis that looks like a meta-analysis. For example, in early childhood, the ways that I can learn about the import of those five bins is to see when something in the situation changes between two studies at different scale, how does that cause the treatment effects to change versus when the population changes or when there are spillovers. So, so I'm doing a bit of that here. The, the tricky part with meta-analysis, though, is if you don't have enough support, it's, it's difficult to make strong conclusions. But, but where I am right now is I think it's a really useful tool. It's a really neat way to aggregate a bunch of information. And if you have an, enough overlap in the Xs that, that are important for scaling, then you can really learn a lot. But if there's no overlap, then you have to make some linearity and um, let, let's say non-synergistic assumptions that just might not be true in the data. I hope that helps, Todd. Yeah, maybe a related question. Trevor McLemore, who I think was one of your winners. One of the winners, uh, equilibrium he, guy. He asks, uh, if, if you're looking for large positive spillovers, how could you do that experimentally when maybe you need a huge sample? I think he's getting at that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me comment on spillovers. So, so first of all, let me be clear that spillovers represent a violation of our first exclusion restriction when we do experiments. So to recover a causal estimate to solve the inference problem, when we use the experimental method, we have four exclusion restrictions. One is SUTVA, one is compliance, one's attrition, and one's statistical independence. So when you have these types of spillovers, 
you are running the risk of not generating a causal parameter that you can understand. So let's put that on the, on the one side. But what I'm saying is there are many cases where you want to have spillovers as your outcome variable. In our check experiment, we were interested in when we run an experiment, like an early childhood program in a community, are there ways that if you estimate things the typical way that you might be underestimating the vitality of the program? And in our program, that was a huge underestimation because there were a lot of spillovers from treatment to control kids. So it was sending us a signal that our program wasn't as strong as what it really was because the control kids were doing too well. You don't necessarily need a large sample for that. What you need though is a strong signal. And what I'm saying is you need a strong spillover to be able to detect it, just like you need a strong instrument we, you know, when you're randomizing. So the important thing is it's well-powered just like any other test and you need a strong enough signal, then you don't have to worry as much. And some, as you can see in our, in our social side of human capital formation, paper, that was a really strong signal. If you were just within 11 kids of a, you know, a thousand feet of your house, it was like you were treated. Mm. And that was like three quarters of a standard deviation on our COG scores. So it, uh, if you have that strong of a signal, you don't need any more sample size than you would a, a normal experimental study. Okay. So, so I hope that helped. Yeah. Uh, then one other question from our group that relates to a question I had, so I'll ask both of them. Cameron Belt asks, when people are looking for business solutions, maybe for successful business, is it really necessary? I'm changing his question a little bit. Is it, is it more valuable, he asks, um, to identify solutions that scale or just to identify a solution yeah. I think that may not scale uh, is that maybe still okay? And then what I want to ask that's related if, uh, is it's very interesting to me that maybe service businesses don't scale as well as you were talking about people don't scale so well, and yet our whole economy has moved towards service businesses. And so if we think about why productivity maybe and GDP isn't growing as fast, might this scalability issue that you're mentioning as we move to service industries be a reason why? So if you can keep yeah. those two questions. Yeah, those are, those are two great questions. So, so let's take on the first one. Um, so when you say, is this a solution to something? And then you secondly ask, is that different or fundamentally more important than a solution that scales? Okay, so a solution that only is applicable to one person in the world, I don't think is necessarily a very important idea. R remember, vital sign number two is what's your extent of market and, and how broad of a reach does your idea have? When you look at the India example, that's a great solution for a core set of people, but that's fundamentally a different solution than say polio vaccinations, which applies to all kids and is perfectly scalable. And that type of solution, of course, when it's more applicable to a broader market, that's one of my definitions of scaling. When you scale an idea, how many people can you affect? If it inherently only affects one or two people, sure, it's a solution, but it's not a broad solution that's going to really change the world unless that one or two people, it still could be important. But what I'm saying is know the extent of your market before spending a bunch of money to scale something that only one or two people might want. Okay, so that's, it's in the book, I call it know your audience. And I think it's really important to understand how large and what type of audience do you have before we roll it out in policy or in business. Now, Mark, I think you're right in that 
as you move service, let, let's be clear though, Uber and Lyft is a service industry. It, it can scale because of the supply side. Now, it's not great on the driver side of the cost side because that's like a constant 80% of, of what comes in, but it scales over the rest. It scales over the insurance cost. It scales over headquarters. But it also scales on the benefit side because as the market grows bigger and bigger and the market gets thicker, our wait times go down because you have a lot of people on the demand and supply side for both um, riders and drivers. So that would be a service industry that has some hope of taking on your GDP. But more generally, I think you're right. I think as we move to goods and services that rely on people, those are elements that don't scale well, and that does not bode well for future GDP growth. I, I think that's really good intuition, but but there are there will be caveats to to that. But but I think in general you're right, Mark. And, and we're over time, but I have a couple more questions. Do, no problem. Have, okay. No problem. So Delik, one of our professors here, and uh, asks. How scalable are ideas themselves, maybe your ideas included, given that policymakers often don't seek to uh, maximize effectiveness, they seek to ma maximize votes. And so do you perceive that there may be some, I guess this is kind of a public choice type question. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so I think about this whole idea about using research to affect the world sort of as three chains and or three links in a chain. The first link is we have to figure out how to generate resources or charitable funds to um, create, let's say, endowments, et cetera, for scholars themselves. Okay, that's a different research agenda. The middle link is what I'm going after is how do we set up the knowledge creation market to be efficient, to bring forward the truth. And then the third link is where your colleague is going, is what are the political economy issues associated with, once you have a good idea, are the incentives correct in the system to make sure that good ideas win and bad ideas don't? So all I can do is tell you that we need the second notch figured out to let them know what good ideas are. I am skeptical like you in that world that all of the good ideas will be adopted. And here's why. There's a fair amount of evidence now that is being generated. Look at Car some of Kartik studies in the development world where he shows that in India, they know that a program doesn't work, but they still scaled it because they're into inputs. They're into announcing that they're doing something and that something that they're doing is understandable. So, so that was their way of generating, look what we're doing. Their objective function was it's on inputs and that's what we did. There's also some work now, um, David Yang, I'm visiting Harvard for the year and David Yang, a, a, a young, brilliant development economist finds some really interesting results that are consistent with everything I talked about today in China, where you have um, ideas that come from the provinces and go to the national government. And he finds slippage, just like I report here, where his provinces are like my, my uh, researchers or my individuals. So all I can say is, you're right, there's a political economy problem that we need to solve. But what I think is, if you focus on here's, here are ideas, here's good scientific evidence on who it works for, and you give all of that information to voters and give it to policymakers, I hope that a more informed voter base, a more informed, look, when I worked in DC, it was all about interest groups coming in and saying, I want this and I want that. So a more informed interest group, I hope all of that will help solve or at least bring us to closer to a solution on the political economy side. But to be fair, I don't really model that fully in the research that I've done so far. That's a good question. Cool. 
Well, two last questions, I'll combine them. They're both related to the experimental method, I think, well, in publication. So Frank Fossen, one of our great researchers asks, uh, if we need more rec re replication studies, how can we get journals to be more interested in those when they tend to be interested in innovative studies rather than something that just says, yep, we replicated this important result. And then the second one asks about your expertise in field work, are there areas where field experiments are particularly good and then maybe areas where they're not as useful maybe as lab experiments? Yeah. Okay, so, so two great questions. These are, uh, these are wonderful questions, Mark. Um, and I could take a half hour on each, but let me, be very, let, let me try to be more concise. So um, on the replications, when you look at the state of replication in the hard sciences, I think we can learn a lot in that the innovative study is published, say, in Science or Nature. And the first replication is also published in Science or Nature. And they can much more quickly come to the truth. You know, is it a false positive? Does this really work? What are the moderators? They also do some causal moderation. The follow-up studies do important mediation analysis. A lot of those get published in top journals. I agree fully that our equilibrium right now is when I try to replicate someone else, what I instantly do is I make an enemy and I have a paper that's impossible to place in a good journal. Now, the first part of that, I've I've done that. Back in the late 90s, I read a paper by Joel Waldfogel on the deadweight loss of Christmas. And I thought, wow, I know that that won't replicate. And I think it's an important result to talk about. So I, I, I tried to replicate and then I did some, I went from hypothetical to real. That, that was the, the external validity issue that I looked at. And I don't think I curried any favors from Joel um, and the dynamic is altogether set up incorrectly because then major journals won't take it. For my part, I think we need to change the nature of when you're right now, when somebody tries to replicate someone else's work, the person who they're trying to replicate feels violated and they feel, wow, they're going to try to show that I'm wrong. And your heart starts beating faster and faster. We need to give scholars credit when they produce results that do replicate. We need to have people invite replication and say, because when it does replicate, I'm going to get more status and prestige and research funds. So that, that's one thing. The second thing is we need to have journals, like you said, that will demand and publish it. For my part, I'm starting a new journal called JPE Micro which as, as Mark mentioned, I'm an editor at the JPE and I see a lot of papers that are really close. And I see what my colleague Jim Heckman calls a tyranny of the top five. It feels like to survive at top places, you need to get in the top five. We need more outlets that people view as super, super good. So I'm going after that with JPE Micro. I'm creating a new journal that will be related to the JPE I'll continue to publish and edit the JPE, but I'm also going to publish and edit a new journal called JPE Micro. And in each one of those issues, there will be one replication at the end of it. Mm. I want to give study, I want to give those studies a chance. It's one thing to sit here and say replication's important, replication this, replication that. But it's another thing to actually do something about it. So that's one reason why I'm starting up the new journal. So to answer your question, I'm trying to alleviate that problem. I'm also part of the editorial board of the ESA journal that started called uh, Journal of, e of Economic Science Association, which is also about replications. Bob Slonim was a very important person early on. I'm on that editorial board. I find that that's important, but it doesn't give it enough in, in terms of people wanting to replicate. Okay, so that, that answers the first question. The second question is, the way I think about the empirical problem is for, for decades, you had people using naturally occurring data. Think about the most recent Nobel Prize, which was a great award, Josh and um, 
uh, Hito and David Card, they're, they're doing work where they don't know the assignment mechanism. So they don't know why people receive treatment and control. They try to have a good instrument and then they try to make causal inference by making some assumptions. Okay, that, that's great stuff. That's one kind of knowledge creation. The other kind is when you know the assignment mechanism. That's what we do typically here, most of us, are we know and we control the assignment mechanism. Now, there are different venues that you can know and control the assignment mechanism. In economics, we started off pretty much in the lab. And Vernon Smith and Charlie Plott and a bunch of great pioneers did great work, sometimes using randomization, other times letting theory give the counterfactual. But nevertheless, they were in a controlled setting trying to generate data. And in many cases, they knew the assignment mechanism. Recently, what I call the third stage of field experiments, something that we've been going through the last 20 or 30 years, and that's running say a first step from the lab is what I call an artifactual field experiment. And that's in the lab, but instead of students, I'm getting the professionals. Everything else is the same. A lot of times, you know, when, when, we, when we talked about these things like artifactual field experiments, this is in the 2004 Journal of Economic Literature paper with Glenn Harrison. A lot of critics were saying the lab is garbage because students aren't real people. So we said, well, look, just go and get the quote real people. That's what we call an artifactual field experiment. And then the critic said, well, it's still artificial because people are doing a task where you're placing them on an artificial margin. So we said, okay, start adding naturalness to the task, to the stakes, et cetera. We called those frame field experiments. Now, at that point, some people said, that's all great. But people will act differently if they know they're part of an experiment. So now the final frontier in that JEL paper is what we call natural field experiments. So that's where you have randomization to identify your treatment effect, but you do it in a realistic environment. And when I say realistic, I mean a naturally occurring market. So people don't even know that they're taking part in an experiment. If all of you, how, how do you get by the human subject? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. <laughs> if all of you have taken Uber or Lyft in the last five years, you've been one of my experimental subjects. So I thank you for helping me learn about the real world. Mark, every one of these studies has IRB approval. Yeah. So the question isn't about IRB approval. To me, the question is about the ethics of running an experiment without informed consent. Occasionally, the IRB says what you really need to do is inform them after the experiment and tell them you were just part of an experiment and you can opt out. Then it doesn't affect selection and, and behavior. Very rarely do people opt out, but occasionally we do that when IRB tells us to. When, when you work with firms, a lot of us have signed the form that says, I understand that um, my identity is not going to be used, but you might be doing Prices, price changes. That's what we're doing in the firms. So I have a chapter in my new um, PhD textbook on experimental economics on the ethics of experimentation. And, and it's important that we have this discussion about what are the ethics of experimentation in general? What are the ethics of a natural field experiment when it's, look, it's great methodologically because I have randomization and realism and that's wonderful, but do we cross lines? And, and I, I set up in the ethics chapter that the person has to be better off for being part of that, and then I'm okay with it. And, and, I, and I go through the rules of, it's, a bit, it's more of a, a consequentialist approach, but that's the way I, I look at it ethically. Now to answer the question, I've now given you several different ways to learn about the world. And any one of those ways, I don't see dominating across the spectrum of questions. I think it's let's look at the question and then let's say across the board, first of all, what is the best way to do it? 
Maybe it's a lab experiment. Maybe it's naturally occurring data. Maybe it's a natural field experiment. But what I will say is that we learn a lot more when we answer each question using the different types of approaches. So if we answer a question using naturally occurring data in a lab experiment, in a frame field experiment, in a natural field experiment, if all of them paint the same sort of picture, I've learned a lot about this phenomena that we're interested in. And if I learn something different, then I need to learn why is it different? What is it that I've changed that causes the difference? And in the end of the day, that's moving science. So to answer your question, I'm not gonna tell you that my approach of field experiments is ubiquitously dominant. I don't believe that. Um, there are some cases where it is. There are other cases where it's not. And what are some examples? Uh, there are some examples like when you have these very large natural experiments on immigration or interest rates. Come on, I'm not going to be able to do that using one of my experiments. It's, it's not a good tool. In many cases, then we don't know the assignment mechanism, but we make assumptions to infer causality. There are other questions like, what's the best way to raise money for the University of Nevada, Reno's econ department? I think a natural field experiment is perfect for that. Um, and look at my last 25 years of research in that area, and it will show what we've learned using natural field experiments. Now, can you then back off and say, can you use a lab to complement what you learned in the natural field experiment? Absolutely. The, the lab is great about inventing crazy things, putting people on crazy artificial margins, and then figuring out mediation paths, and then taking that to other settings and seeing, does that then go out? You know, does this wind tunnel work over here? And in that way, it's really a symbiotic relationship that I have, just like theory and empirics, I think of lab and field is a symbiotic relationship as well. So that was a long-winded answer, Mark, but no, you can tell I've thought about it a little bit. And we've used a lot of your time, so I think I'll conclude here. Um, Michelle, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Uh, I, I want to take, if you can conclude, John, I had asked you a question right before we got on. Uh, I, I shared you, John's record. I shared that if he doesn't win the Nobel Prize, I'll <laughs> wonder about the people in Sweden at some point. And just incredibly productive, wonderful life. And many of the people who are left on here, I think, are academics. Maybe some students who want to take a path like you took. And I asked you earlier, you know, how are you just as incredibly productive as you are? You're still smiling. You're not miserable. <laughs> you enjoy what you're doing. How do you do it? And you gave an interesting answer. So I think that's a good way to end if you would. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, I'm going to give a, a two minute answer where before I give you a 30 second answer. Right. Um, so I want to just talk about in general, I've met a lot of successful people. And they tend to have three, four, or five features that they all share. Um, one of those features is that they're monomaniacal. So you talk to Travis Kalanick, the founder of Uber. He was monomaniacal that he wanted to transform urban transportation. Talk to President Bush, same thing. Talk to Jim Heckman, same thing. Talk to Gary Becker, same thing. They're monomaniacal. Uh, two, they do things that they're good at. And what they're good at they tend to understand that's comparative advantage and economies, of course, but they're not good at other things. So they tend to build a team around themselves that they understand the production function, they understand how they fit in, they understand that they need to put inputs around themselves to make sure that they can maintain high voltage throughout their careers. This not only happens in academia, it happens in the business world all over. Now, the, let's just talk about the third one then. And, and that's that people are constantly admitting the highly successful people that they don't know the answer. So a lot of times people come to decisions and they know already how they're going to answer and they don't need science. A lot of times people have this egocentric mind where it's nearly impossible to get them to change their mind. They have no theory of mind. 
uber successful people have great theory of mind and use science to form their own opinions and update appropriately. So I'll stop there, Mark. I hope that was was useful. No, that's very cool. Well, the weather is beautiful here. I know it's a little later there, but we'll all go out and enjoy the afternoon. You're in the late afternoon. Hope it's nice in Chicago. That's where you are, right? I am in Chicago right now. Thanks, Mark. Right. Well, enjoy the day. We really appreciate you coming. I don't know, Mehmet, if you want to say anything to conclude, but we really appreciate you coming on, John, and, and relaying what I think is a wonderful opportunity. And I'll, I'll mention I've pre-ordered your book. So I've done my part and I love would it. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> Mehmet, go ahead. Yeah, uh, th yeah. Thank you, John, again. And uh, I, I, I'll uh, repeat the, uh, the thing I said before. I hope uh, you know, you'll visit us in person uh, and hopefully soon. And, uh, and also uh, just to let everybody know that we're gonna uh, you know, get um, a few copies of uh, John's uh, the, the Voltage Effect. And then uh, you know, we're gonna, I guess, distribute it to mainly to students, but also maybe to some faculty. Great. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, you know, I, I hope uh, we see you again. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And thanks everyone for your great questions. I, I can't wait to see you live. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. So thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.